Luke chapter 18. And look at verse number 26. The Bible reads, And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? Who then can be saved? That's the title of the sermon this morning. Who then can be saved? This chapter is not too deep. This chapter is pretty straightforward. And it covers a lot about salvation, about how one can be saved. What must you do to be saved? You know, how must you approach God in order to receive salvation? In fact, you could give this chapter a second title, such as the proud versus the humble. This deals a lot with pride. It deals a lot with humility and how we are to come before God. So let's start off by looking at verse number one there, Luke chapter 18, verse one. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now let me just start off by saying we're continuing with parables of Jesus Christ, but what I like about chapter 18 is that Jesus Christ tells us exactly what the parables are going to be about before he tells us. So it tells us there in verse number one that this parable that I'm going to tell you is that men that you ought to always to pray, that you are always to pray and not to faint, not to give up, you know, and this is an area of our life that I think a lot of Christians struggle with. A lot of Christians, when I, when I talk to people about, you know, how they're going in the spiritual walk, yeah, they're coming to church, yeah, they're reading their Bibles, they may even be out soul winning, but quite often it's just that prayer time, that alone time with God, you know, going into your closet, going into your bedroom, somewhere private, and, and having that conversation with God the Father. And, and sometimes people just faint, faint at that task, you know, because it is a spiritual work. You know, it's not so much a physical work, but it does require strength of the Spirit to go before God and to pray. And if you're like me, I've had experiences where I've gone, you know, to bed at night and I've started to pray to the Lord, you know, and then I wake up in the next morning not knowing did I finish that prayer or not. I mean, have you been there? Have you ever woken up and you're like, have I, did I finish that prayer last night? You know, because it, it, is, it is tiring for the Spirit. It is work of the Spirit. You know, but let's look at verse number two. Let's look at this parable. So already God has already, Christ has already given us what this parable is about. Verse number two, saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. I mean, this judge, I mean, look, if you're in a position of authority where you need to make decisions, where you may need to make right judgment, you, you already have a poor start if you have no fear of God. And that's the problem with our governments today. That's the problem with our politicians today. They're passing judgment, they're making laws for our nation, but they just don't have a fear of God. They don't turn to the Word of God and find the answers that God gives us. They don't want to see what's righteous. They don't want to see what's sinful or what's a crime and what God has to say about, you know, correct punishment for certain crimes. That's, that's our world today. Politicians at large do not fear God. And as a natural consequence of not fearing God, they naturally do not regard man, okay? Because if they're not taking what's righteous from God's perspective, then how can they expect to do right in accordance to their fellow man, you know, uh, uh, to, to make sure that, you know, their fellow man's been avenged for the, for the wrong that they've done or, that, you know, uh, the, the wicked are not being uh, punished the way God sees fit. So we really see this judge is in a bad position. No fear of God, no regard of man. He's in it for himself. He's, he's in it for making a name for himself. But look at verse number three. And there was a widow in that city. So a widow, a, a woman that doesn't have a man to represent her. She doesn't have a husband to stand up for her, to defend her. So there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him saying, avenge me of mine adversary. She brings a case where, where someone has done wrong to her and she's looking for justice. She's looking for, um, to be avenged for the wrong that's been done toward her. Verse number four. And he would not for a while. Because this guy has no regard for man. You know, even less a widow who's probably, you know, lower on the social scale. You know, he doesn't listen for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, though I fear not God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. <laughs> so this widow just keeps coming to this unjust judge just continues bringing her request, please avenge me, please avenge me. And this judge, even though he's unjust, even though he's wicked, even though he has no fear of man, just, just, just for this woman to just leave me alone, instead of her coming to trouble me over and over again, I just, I just want to get rid of her. I'm going to answer her request. I'm going to avenge her. 
um, for, the, uh, uh, for the adversary, what, what he had done against her. And it's interesting because Jesus uses this analogy or this parable as prayer. Now, do you think God the Father is going to treat us that way? When his children come before him, we bring our needs, we bring our requests before God. Of course, we know God is not unjust. I mean, if, if anyone's just, it's, it's the God of the universe. It's the God of the Bible. All right? But Christ has just given us a really bad example of a really bad judge. And yet even he, you know, just to be left alone, will answer that request of that widow woman. Okay? So let's have a look at it. Verse number 6. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect? Listen to me. Have you been uh, mistreated? Do you have enemies that hate you, have done wrong against you? You know, maybe they've taken things that, uh, taken your possessions. Maybe they've taken your finances. Maybe they've not paid back what they said they were going to do. You know, people have done wrong to you. You know, you should take uh, a relief in the fact that in verse number seven, and shall not God avenge his own elect? Yeah. Now, if you're saved, God's going to avenge you. You can't always get justice on this world, but we know that God sees all things. We know we're children of God if we're saved, and God will avenge us for the wrong that's been done toward us. You know, we need, to, we need to rest in that. You know, instead of us getting bitter and frustrated, God, I want my justice. No, just let go and give it to God. You know, God's going to avenge you. And then it says, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. What, what should we take out of that? That we should be people that come to God and cry day and night unto him. Hey, this is encouraging believers to be praying continually. Day and night, we should be bringing our requests before God. Okay? Now, we should leave it in God's hands. Take things that we have no control over, the burdens that are on our shoulders, put it to God. But we shouldn't leave those things alone. We should keep asking God about these things. Keep talking to Him. He's our Father. You know, parents, if your children came with an urgent need, with something they needed, you know, wouldn't you attend to that need? And if you've kind of forgotten, but your kids keep coming and, and reminding you, I need this, I need this, eventually you'll be like, okay, yeah, this is the time I can go and fulfill that need for you. You know, so much more our Heavenly Father wants to avenge His own elect. But the requirement is that we come to Him. We cry day and night. We bring our requests before Him. And I think part of the reason, and I know this is my personal experience, part of the reason I fail to go to God in prayer more often is I often think, and this is just the, the, the failure of the flesh, I often think, Man, God must be sick of hearing about me. You know, God must be sick of hearing my request. But we see in this parable that God wants us to cry day and night unto Him, to bring our request before Him. Please, if, if you're like me and you have those, those doubts, no, don't. You know, we should be going boldly to the throne of God. We, we, you know, we have the Spirit of His Son, the Jesus Christ in us, and we are made the children of God. Verse number 8. And I tell you that He will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless... When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And I think that's a challenge that Jesus Christ is placing at our feet, um, guys. Is He asks that question, you know, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? What's he saying? When I come back in my second coming, am I going to find the people of God with faith? Am I going to find them praying to God, relying on Him, trusting on Him? I mean, you know, we hold a, a post-tribulation position where we, we believe that the last generation of believers will be persecuted by the Antichrist. Now, how much more then should we be praying and seeking God for deliverance? How much more then should we be filled with faith? You know, ask God to increase our faith and call upon Him with our every need. So, that's our challenge. Is He going to find you, brethren? Is He going to find you, brothers and sisters, in faith? Is He going to find you praying to God, you know, day and night, continually, and asking of Him or not? I hope you take that challenge on board from Jesus Christ and say, yeah, today I'm going to start crying day and night to my Lord and bringing my request before Him. And look, they don't have to be long-winded prayers. You know, just, just coming to the Lord, you know, and, and, and seeking Him it can be just a couple of minutes, you know. In fact, some, most, a lot of my prayers are just a few seconds. You know, driving in the car or, you know, on, especially when I'm flying on the plane. You know, as soon as take off, you know, the, the plane starts taking off on Tuesdays, I'm like, dear Lord, this is a big machine here. Please keep it in the sky. <laughs> and then as we're landing into Sydney, I'm like, dear Lord, please let the, the, the landing be safe and secure. <laughs> I'm always praying a few seconds to the Lord when, I, when I'm flying. 
That's when I'm the best Christian, by the way, when I'm in the air. I'm, I'm always with the Lord, and, you know. Let's keep reading verse number nine. And then he tells us, uh, talks of a second parable here. And again, he gives us the explanation of this parable before he gets into it. He says, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Okay, now keep your finger there. Turn to Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians chapter 1. What does it mean for certain people which trust in themselves? What does that mean exactly? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12. I just want to show you this. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12. The Bible reads that we should be the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. You know, when we go door to door, we preach the gospel... You know, we tell people that they need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes people struggle. What does it mean to believe? Does it mean to believe the facts that he was there, believe the facts that he died on the cross? That's part of it. But we see here that the Bible uses the word trust interchangeably. Okay? You know, when, when we believe on Jesus Christ for our eternal salvation, we've essentially trusted on Christ. We've trusted his death, burial, and resurrection, you know, as the payment for our sins. And so when we think about this parable of people that are trusting in themselves, then we can easily say, well, these people are not believing on Christ. They're believing in themselves. They're believing in their righteousness. They're trusting in their own righteousness. Look at verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 1. In whom ye also trusted, after, ye, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So we see how God there uses interchangeably the word trust and believe. And so go back to Luke 18. Now. I just wanted to show you that in the scriptures. And I think that's a really great way. You know, when, when you're preaching the gospel, you know, this is something I've only come up with in the last sort of couple of years, where when I say to someone, when I read John 3.16, that whosoever believeth in him, and then, and then I'll put this, this before them, and I'll say to them, look, if I said to you, I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person, because I, I go to church, because I gave money to the poor, because I helped the old lady cross the street. Am I trusting in myself? Am I trusting in Kevin to go to heaven? Or am I trusting in Jesus? And when I put it that way, they tend to, oh, you're trusting in yourself. All right, but if I said to you that I'm not a good person, that I'm a sinner, but Jesus Christ died for my sins, was buried and rose again on the third day, and I am trusting him to take me to heaven, am I now believing on Kevin? Or am I now believing on Jesus Christ? And at that point, it clicks in their mind. Go, oh, wow, yeah. You know, now you're believing on Christ. Now you're trusting in Christ. So that's how I present it to him when I go door to door. But look at verse number 10. Verse number 10 of Luke 18. So this is the parable. Two men went up into the, mount, uh, sorry, into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, so one a religious leader, and the other a publican. publican. You know, just, just a regular government worker, workers. And the publican in those days weren't trusted. A lot of them weren't, you know, weren't just in the way they handled business. So they weren't really trusted by the people. Verse 11. The Pharisees stood. And look at this. We're talking about prayer. You know, we ought to be praying to God the Father who wants to avenge His elect, who wants to answer our prayers. But this Pharisee prays. And it says there in verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Hey, he didn't pray to God. He prayed to himself. Why? Because he's trusting in himself. You know, people, when you go and, and knock doors and, and they tell you they love God, they tell you they're a Christian, but you ask them, what must you do to be saved? They say, I'm a good person. Hey, when they pray, they're not praying to God. They're praying with themselves because they're trusting in their own works. They're trusting in themselves. What does he say in verse 11? He says, God, I thank thee. So who is he calling God? Himself. <laughs> he's praying with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. You know, I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. You know, so this is the religious leader. All right. And, you know, you don't need, you don't need to be, you don't need to only hear that from the religious leaders. Again, you go door to door soul winning, and it's exactly what people say. You know, you know, what do you think someone has to do to go to heaven? Or if someone says they're sure of they're going to heaven, if they're not saved, what do you believe you have to, what, 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 yeah, you know, what gives you the assurance that you're on your way to heaven? 
well, I'm a good person. You know, that's, what, that's exactly what the Pharisee is saying, right? I, I, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. I've been a good person. You know, surely I deserve salvation. Surely I deserve heaven. Or they might say something like, you know, I haven't committed any of the major sins. You know, I've not murdered anybody. You know, I've not raped anybody. I've never done any of those major sins compared to other men in this world, like that publican over there. That's the same response we get every time we go door to door soul winning. You know, or, you know, I'm not wicked like, like many others, you know, pointing their fingers at other people and saying, you know, they're a cut above, you know, uh, their generation or whatever. It's exactly the response of the Pharisees. These people, when you hear those responses, they're trusting in themselves. They pray to themselves. They pray with themselves. All right? Look at verse number 13. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. Hey, what's the impression that you get of this man? That he's so ashamed of his sins that he can't even lift up his head. All right? This man is showing humility. What did the Pharisee show? He was full of pride. Look at me, Lord. I deserve it. Okay? This man, the other way around, full of humility, full of shame as he approaches God. But smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's his prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, that being the Pharisee, full of pride, he will be brought down low, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The one that humbles himself, that comes before God, seeking his mercy and humility. You know, God will raise that man up. God will justify that man in his sight. What does it mean to be justified? What does it mean to be justified? I'll get you guys to turn to Romans chapter 3 very quickly. Romans chapter 3. Again, keep your finger in Luke 18. What does it mean to be justified? My old, my old pastor at Victory Baptist Church used to say, justified means just if I'd never sinned. Justified. Justified never sinned. You know, I, 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 I'm righteous. I'm clean before God, as it were. Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall... Uh, sorry, I'll read that again. Romans 3, 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law... There shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Hey, the Pharisee in the parable was coming before the law saying, Hey, I, I, I match up to the law. But there's no justification in the sight of God through the law. Okay, It's to bring us a knowledge of sin. Verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all upon them, upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Look at this. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now you've been justified if you've believed on Jesus. Jesus, God, God is the justifier and he's made you just. You know what? Being justified is better than justified never sinned. It's better than that because you're actually given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's beyond just not sinning. You have the perfection of God in that new man. Okay? Yeah, we, we know we still have the flesh and we struggle with that. That's a topic for another day. But we see what justification is. It's, it's taking on Jesus Christ. It's believing on Christ. Uh, trusting Him. It's, it's, it's been, we've been justified freely. It's not of our works. It's not of our efforts. It's not by keeping the laws of God. And it's the same thing that this publican did when he prayed. He just smote his breast. He couldn't lift up his head in humility and, and ask God for mercy. Back to Luke 18. Luke 18. Verse 13. Just again, verse 13. I know we read this again. But what did the publican say? God be merciful to me, a sinner. Did the publican say, God, 
I repent of my sins. Do the publicans say, God, I'm turning from my sins? No. All right? Did he say, I, I'm willing, God, I'm willing to turn from my sins. I'm willing to get your law and follow your law. Is that what justified him? No. It was simply the admission that he's a sinner and he needed the mercy of God. Okay? Look, we should confront people with their sins. We should tell them that they're sinners. All right? But that's to make them realize that they need a savior. That's not to, to make them think they need to change their lives and turn another leaf for salvation. Otherwise, they're trusting in themselves, Amen. just as the Pharisee had done. Right. Let's keep reading verse number 15. So we move on from those two um, parables. But you'll notice that the, these themes just continue in the whole chapter. And they brought unto him, they brought unto Jesus, these are parents. The parents brought unto him also infants, children, little children, that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. The disciples, the little children came. All right? It's like little children come to church. You know, and parents bring in their children to come and hear the word of God. And, you know, and, and, and pride fills our hearts and go, no, no, this place is not for children. And you rebuke them. You say, no, you know, the children are too loud. The children are too distracting. distracting. Take them away to the mother's room or take them away to the Sunday school class or things. No, we want our children here. We want our children listening to the word of God. Now, I'm not Jesus Christ, but you know, the word of God, Jesus Christ is the word of God. You know, so when we preach the word of God, we are preaching Jesus Christ to the children as well as to the adults. You can see that the pride of man, they're lifting themselves up against the children. And children are distracting. And they are. Sometimes I get distracted. I'm preaching here. I see the kids, you know, walking around or, you know, making frequent trips to the toilet or whatever. You know, we should teach our kids to sit down. But at the same time, it gives me great joy that the kids are here. It gives me great joy that there's a regeneration that we're trying to train to love the Lord, to serve Him. And hopefully they go and do greater works than what we've done. Look at verse 16. How does Jesus respond? But Jesus called, unto the, uh, called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me. Allow little children, that's what suffer means, to allow. Allow the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. What does Jesus say? He says the kingdom of God, heaven, is filled with little children. Why do we want little children in the church? Why is it when we go door to door soul winning, we're excited when a child answers the door, or a teenager, young man? It's because they're more receptive to the gospel. Amen. You know, they haven't been corrupted. Their minds haven't been corrupted. They're not trusting in themselves. They already have an innate, innate knowledge that there's a God, that there's a heaven and hell, and they want to make sure that they're right before God. You know, before they get into their schools and they're taught, you know, humanism and all kinds of, you know, you know, worldly philosophies before their minds get corrupted. It's exciting when you talk to a young one because you know the chance of them getting saved is much higher than when they're an adult. So Jesus tells us, look, heaven is filled with little children. All right? But also verse number 17, it's not just physically little children, but look at verse 17. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. So if we want to be saved, we want to enter into the kingdom of, of heaven, into the kingdom of God, we need to become like little children. Say, so what do you mean? You know, well, humility. You know, we need to realize, hey, there is a God. I need a savior. I, I want to know that I'm right with God and, and I'm not going to trust in myself. I'm going to trust in what God says in his word. That's what it means to come as little children. You know, when you tell a child something, they tend to believe you. You know, the, you know almost, almost immediately, you know, when I talk to my children, you know, they don't have to say, Dad, are you lying? Are you telling the truth? You know, if I tell them a fact, for them, it's the truth. You know, it, it's true. So when you show children the Word of God, they're more ready to believe it. They're more, more ready to receive it. But it, it's the same thing with us. You know, if, if we're adults and we haven't, you know, we need to be saved, we need to come as little children and just trust what God has said in His Word. You know, be humble. Come with humility rather than that critical adult mindset that can ultimately get you to turn away from God. Oh, that's the other thing I've got here, is that children like to receive gifts. You know, children are more likely to receive a free gift. They won't really question it, right? You know, it, it, it's, uh, we, we, we've adults, like if I came and I got a gift and I, presented, I gave you guys a gift, 
immediately your, your response will be, oh, you, you didn't have to. Or, you know, I, I don't deserve that. Or, you know, you don't have to do that for me. Like kids, you give them a gift, they're like, yeah, let's open it. <laughs> All right? And, and salvation is that free gift. Is that free gift from God. And, uh, you know, the kids rejoice in free gifts. You know, that's why we need to come to God as little children. Come in humility. Come with the mindset of, of a child. Let's keep reading verse number 18. And now we have the, the, the story of, of the rich young ruler that came before Jesus. And hey, I'll tell you now, he came in pride. He didn't come in humility before God. Verse number 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Instead of saying to Jesus, Jesus, what have you got for me? You know, what are you, what's this gift that I'm hearing about? You know, what's this water that I've been hearing about? That, that, you know, if I drink it, I'll never thirst. What's this all about? He says, no, look, he comes to the good master and says, what shall I do? What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? Now, was Jesus good? Of course, he was perfect. Okay, he is good. But why callest thou me good? None is good save one that is God. So, by the response of Jesus, Jesus doesn't respond this way to everyone that, that calls upon him. You know, my understanding here is that Jesus is, is causing this r- ruler to understand that he is God. Okay? If Jesus is good and you're calling me good master, then you also have to acknowledge that I am God. That's what Jesus is saying. So it, it, it seems like this young rich ruler probably saw him as, as a good prophet, as a good teacher, but did not recognize that this was the Son of God, that this was, you know, God manifest in the flesh. Verse number 20, and so this is how Jesus answers to him, thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, that means do not lie, honor thy father and thy mother, and he said, all these have I kept from my youth up, all right? So what does Jesus say? He gives them parts of the Ten Commandments. Primarily the parts that have to do with dealing with your common man. All right? And this is something similar. When we go to the door, you know, the the question we, you know, I think all of us ask is, you know, have you ever told a lie? You know, and most people are willing to say, like 90%, 90, 99% of people are willing to say, yeah, I've told a lie. You know, and maybe they'll say, I've told many lies in my life. But Jesus asked him, you know, do not bear false witness. What does he say in verse number 21? And he said, all these have I kept from my youth up. (laughs) Do you think this guy really has never told a lie in his life? He just told a lie right then, you know. And I, I, I haven't really come across it so much here in Australia. But when I was in Detroit and I went soul winning, it happened twice in one day where two ladies... When we, we were asked, them, have you ever told a lie? I've never told a lie. Have you, um, wait, okay, so um, have you ever stolen anything? No, I've never stolen anything. It's like, have you ever sinned? No, I've never sinned. It's like, what in the world? You know, essentially it's the answer of the young rich ruler. I've kept these from my youth up. You know, and these people that have this approach to, to, of themselves, they're trusting themselves. They think they're righteous. They think they're, 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 they're godly, Okay. These people, I've never seen anyone like this get saved. They're not even willing to admit they've done anything wrong. I think they realize if I admit that I've done something wrong, then I need help. Then I need a savior. And instead of trying to get, you know, being there, they're just, uh, I've done nothing wrong. I'm fine. It's crazy. You know, thank God in Australia, I don't, I don't you know, I don't really, uh, maybe once, you know, out, out door to the soul winning, but I noticed in America that seems to be more, more of a frequent answer. Uh, verse number 22. Now, when Jesus heard these things, (laughs) he said unto him, Yet likest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. He's basically saying, look, come and become my disciple. Yeah, okay, you you know, you're saying you've kept all these things. Now it's time for you to take all your riches, give it to the poor, and come and be focused on eternal matters. Come and lay up treasures in heaven rather than treasures on this earth. You know, Jesus knew where this man's heart was. The reason he was full of pride, the reason he was full of self-righteousness was just because of his position. A young, rich ruler, and he had great wealth. 
and he wasn't willing to let that go for God. Hey, this was a man that was seeking to justify himself with the law of Moses. This was a man that was trying to seek to justify himself by his own righteousness. And so Jesus gives him another measure of righteousness. Hey, sell it all. Come and follow me. And he, you know, this man was unable to do it. Let's keep reading verse number 23. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. All right? And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And that again, that's a, that's a true principle. People that have more. When you go to the more affluent areas of, this, you know, of the Sunshine Coast, those with more riches, it's almost... It's much harder for people to be receptive to the Word of God because they have their riches. They think we're doing fine. Why do I need God? You know, I'm a self-made man. I've got my money. I'm well taken care of. Why do I need God? It's the same thing with this young rich ruler. He looked at himself. He looked at his riches. He had pride, and he wasn't able to let that go. Now, look, do you think if he sold all his things and followed after Jesus, that would have saved him? Of course not. Because you cannot be saved. You cannot be justified by the works of the law. Okay? But Jesus is just showing him where he comes short. You know? And if you're someone that's trying to be saved by your own righteousness, by trying to keep the laws of Moses yourself, then, hey, you need to do it all. You need to give it all up and follow after Christ. You're never going to do it because you've already lied. You've already broken the law. All right? And then look at verse number 25. For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, notice this. When you think of a, of a camel, it's a big creature, and you think of a needle, even the bigger, biggest needles you can find, are you ever going to fit a camel through a needle? It's impossible. It's impossible. Okay? What Jesus is saying, this rich man that was trusting his riches, it's impossible for this man to be saved by you know, by, by uh, trusting in his ability to keep the laws of Moses. It was impossible for him, okay? And uh, the reason I want to bring this up is just in case you guys have heard this. And look, when you're reading your Bible, just stick to the Word of God. Amen. You know, don't go to your commentaries. Don't go to that, some of that. There's a lot of nonsense in these books. Yeah. And I, I remember just hearing a preacher behind the pool at a good church. I'm not bagging out the church, but just a, a layman preacher gets up, reads this, preaches on this. And he says, well, this, this, uh, this camel going through the, through the needle's eye, or the eye of the needle. He goes, you know, you need to understand, back in, back in the days of Jesus Christ, you know, and you, we, we know, you know, Jerusalem, for example, had walls around it, and there were certain gates. You had to travel through the gates to get into the city. The reason for the walls was so, you know, you defend yourself from your enemies. Well, at night, they say, and this might be true, it might be true, at night, those gates will be closed, but if you wanted to travel into the city, there were small doors, small passageways that you would need to go through at night. And I'm not denying the history behind that. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not, okay? But what they say is, these doors were known as the needle's eye. These doors were known as the eye of the needle. And so when travelers would come at night with their big camels, you know, they wouldn't open the main gates. So they had to get their, their camels, their camels would need to get down on their knees, they take the burdens of their camels, you know, and walk through the needle's eye, the small passageway, and then with the camel on their knees, the camel would need to then slowly. It was very hard. It was a very slow process. You know, but it was possible. But it was very hard to get the camel to go through that needle's eye of that gate. It totally destroys the parable. Because he's saying, look, in order, because this is about salvation. This is about coming to the kingdom of God. You know? So what are you saying then? That it is possible for a camel to go for the eye of the needle. It, it, it is possible to be saved for a very hard and slow process, totally destroying the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What Jesus is saying here is that it's impossible. Hey, if it's possible for a camel to go through a little gate, then it destroys what Jesus is teaching here. He says it's impossible. Okay? Have a look. We'll keep reading. You say, where does it say it's impossible? Let's keep reading. Verse 26. And they that heard it said, who then can be saved? Because they realize this is more than just being a rich man. Okay? Who can be saved? Because a, a camel cannot go through the eye of a needle. Verse 27. But he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Hey, salvation by keeping the law of Moses 
Salvation by self-righteousness, salvation by trusting in yourself is impossible. Hey, but it's possible in God because it's Jesus Christ that offers us that free gift. It's Jesus Christ that made it possible. It's Jesus Christ that kept the laws of God perfectly. And it's through His righteousness, through His imputed righteousness that we can be saved. It is possible. In fact, it's very easy. Right? It's very easy. Jesus did all the hard work. All we're required to do is put our full faith and trust on Him, receive the free gift of salvation. Verse number 28, And Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Hey, look, it's never a waste of time to serve Jesus Christ. It's never a waste of time giving up whatever it is that you need to give up in order to serve Christ. You know, giving up your time to go soul winning, giving up your strength to, to serve Him, you know, giving up your time to prepare a sermon and preach a sermon. You know, it, and I'll cover this before, even if, if no one thanks you, it's not a waste of time because God has many manifold rewards prepared for you in heaven. That's where it matters. And, that, you know, Peter's asking the question, we've left it all, Lord. Hey, those disciples, they gave it all up to follow after Christ, gave up their full-time jobs, gave up their comfortable lives or whatever. You know, these men are going to receive great rewards. These, these, these are going to be great leaders in the kingdom of God. It is worth serving Jesus Christ. Verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. So now this is basically Jesus' last trip into Jerusalem. This is where, you know, eventually he's going to be crucified. And notice this, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spit on. And they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. Hey, these are beautiful words to our ears like we understand it we understand that jesus went to jerusalem to die on that cross of calvary to pay for our sins and to rise again that third day hey we serve a living god we serve a resurrected savior and by by understanding his resurrection we too know that one day we are going to receive our resurrected bodies with him and be caught up in the air and so shall we ever be with the lord now these are beautiful things but notice verse 34 and they understood none of these things. He's talking to his disciples, not to non-believers, to his disciples. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. All right, so, you know, I don't have time to cover this right now. But, you know, there was a difference in the understanding of Old Testament saints and New Testament saints on, on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can see that the disciples here were lacking understanding. They couldn't understand what was being said. Okay? But even though the understanding is clear in the New Testament compared to the Old Testament, it's still the one gospel. Okay? And I haven't got time to cover this right now, but Brother Callum, I think was it was last year, he preached a great sermon on, I think it was called One Gospel. So if you're curious to see the, you know, the similarities with the Old Testament, the way people were saved, in fact, it's the same way. It's by believing on God. It's by putting your full faith and trust on Him. And they had pictures of this, right? In, in, the, in the practices of the Old Testament ways, they had pictures of, of what was to come. They had the sacrifices of, of you know, the, the blood that was shed of the animals, you know. They, had, they could see, you know, some of it, but it wasn't fully understood till the New Testament. But it's, it's interesting what Jesus says in verse, um, verse number, where is it? 31. He says, uh, And all things that were written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man... So it's not that this was like this total mystery that nobody knew. The prophets wrote about it, okay? And, and, and the Bible says that actually God gave the gospel to Abraham, which is why when he, when he went to sacrifice his son Isaac, he had an expectation that Isaac would be resurrected from the dead because he understood more than some of these other Old Testament prophets and these, these disciples. Just quickly turn to Luke 24. Keep your finger there in Luke 18, but turn to Luke 24. Luke 24, verse 25. Luke 24, 25. This is after the resurrection of Jesus. Notice this. 
And he said unto them, these are Jesus' words, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You know, we have a great privilege being, being believers in the New Testament. We've got the New Testament to help us understand the Old Testament passages. And when, when you understand, you know, Jesus Christ, and you can see, you, when you read the Old Testament, you see all these types, you see all these things, and you go, like, this is about Jesus. You know, what a great thing. We've been given a greater honor than many of these disciples had, or many of the Old Testament, you know, um, prophets had. So please, don't neglect your Bibles. You know, you've got an amazing privilege that, you know, the Old Testament saints wish they, they could take all 66 books of the Bible and have that at home. You know, we've been given a great privilege. Please don't waste it. Let's go back to Luke 18, verse 35. And we're up to the last story in this chapter. And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the, sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. So you've got a blind man on the side of the road. He hears all these people walking, all this commotion. He's like, what's this about? He asked the question. They say, well, Jesus of Nazareth is coming by. And it, the next words tells us this man was a believer. This was, this was a man that had trusted in Jesus Christ, even though physically with his eyes he had not yet seen him. Verse 38, and he cried saying, Jesus, thou son of David. Hey, who's David? King David. How does this man even know this? I mean, just, just a random person in the scriptures. Hey, I know you're the son of David, right? And he says, have mercy on me. It's the same words that the publican said of God, have mercy on me. You know, be merciful to me, a sinner. But in the story of the parable, that's where the publican was justified before God. This man already recognizes who Jesus is, but he has an infirmity. He has blindness, you know. And again, bringing it back because we started with prayer, didn't we? We started with bringing our prayers before God. And we see we end in the same way. That this blind man with the infirmity of blindness calls upon Jesus and says, Have mercy on me. Again, prayer is a time where we need to humble ourselves and bring us before the throne of God and bring our request before Him. But he recognizes, hey, you're the son of David. And I'll just quickly read to you from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Just very quickly, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. This is God speaking to King David. He says, And when thy days are fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. So David, when you pass away, when you sleep with your fathers, he says, I will set up thy seed after thee. Now, yes, the primary, the, the first application is about uh, King Solomon. But when you look at what he says, this is beyond Solomon. He says, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. So that's about Solomon. Yes, but notice the next words. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. God promises David, he says, look, when you sleep, there's going to be a seed after you, and the kingdom is going to be forever. There's going to be a king that sits on that throne forever. And we know that it's Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus Christ was the king of, or is the king of kings. All right? And so when this blind man hears of Jesus and Nazareth, he goes, that's the son of David. That's what I read in 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is the one that's going to be, you know, establish his kingdom forever. That's why he calls him the son of David. You know, he, he knew his scriptures, even though he was blind. Because back then, you'd go into the synagogue, you'd, you'd hear the preaching, you'd hear the reading of God's word, you know. A lot of the people didn't have physical copies of the Bible. Verse 39. And they which went before rebuked him. So similar to the little children come in and the parents being rebuked for bringing the children. Same thing. You know, there's, there's a blind man, there's a disabled man. They rebuke him. You know what? Not only should our church be for, the, for children, but it should be for those that are without, those that are disabled, those that are struggling with life. You know, if people come to a church, I never, look, I'll call you out for this. You know, if, if you turn your nose, you know, you're, you're nosed up against people that come, you know, visitors, people that, you know, don't really fit the mold, you know, and you make them feel uncomfortable, you rebuke them, hey, I'll call you out for that, okay? Church is for all people to come in and hear the Word of God. It doesn't matter if the man's blind, 
doesn't matter if the guy's lame. doesn't matter if the, if the person's poor and can't give to the offering. Hey, if people want to come and hear the words of God, they're welcome. Children, disabled, poor, all kinds of people. Verse 39. And they uh, which went before rebuked him, and that he should hold his peace. Hey, be quiet. Shut up. But he cried so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Seeking mercy, coming before God in humility. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath saved thee. And by the saved there, I don't believe that's about the salvation of his soul. It's just the salvation, I guess, of, of, of his eyes. You know, his, his faith. He had already had his faith placed on Jesus. And that had caused him to recover. That caused him to receive his sight. And we see this man definitely had faith on Jesus Christ. Verse 43. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. What, a, what an amazing story. The blind can now see. You know, and that's the same for our salvation. You now, before we were saved, we were blind. Blinded to the words of God. Blinded to the gospel. Blinded to the, to the great mysteries that God gives us in His word. But when we're saved, you know, it's those blinds, it, we're able to see. You know, we're able to see what God has in store. We're able to understand you know, His righteousness. We can understand how sinful we are before God. I mean, it's so stupid when you ask people, you've got to turn from your sins to be saved. Hey, they're blind. You know, they can't see properly. How can you tell people to turn from sins? You know, I, I was saved young, so I feel like I always knew what the Bible said. But, you know, my wife, for example, she was saved when she was 19, I think. And uh, she said to me, after I got saved, and I started to read the Bible, I started to realize, man, I'm, I'm, I really am a sinner. <laughs> Look at all these things that the Bible says. And I didn't realize these were sins, and I, I realize now that, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a sinner exceedingly. You know, it's the same thing. God gives us a vision. God gives us understanding. But we need to seek that from Him. We need to go before God, ask for wisdom, ask for understanding, ask for God to open our eyes. You know, if there are things that are hard to understand in the Bible, ask God for wisdom, ask Him for understanding. If you find God's judgment is too harsh, say, God, just help me renew my mind. Help me to be aligned with what Your Word, what your word says. And God can take those blindfolds off you. You know, not just in salvation, but in just growing and understanding the Word of God. And, you know, we should be glorifying Him when He answers our prayers. All right, that's what I've got for you today, guys. We need to be people of humility. Okay, yes, to be saved, but yes, also to come before God, you know, in, in our request, of, our, our prayer requests, to come before Him and, and not be, you know, trusting in this flesh, not trusting in our own strength. Let's pray.